Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. We're continuing with Chapter 2 today, doing Section 2-2, uh, which is about histograms. So uh, histograms are kind of similar to frequency tables or frequency distributions. They sort of give you the same information. Um, it's just that a histogram kind of gives it to you in a uh, picture format. And it's kind of easier to see the shape of the distribution with a histogram. OK, so when we talk about a histogram, I think everybody has probably seen a bar graph. Okay. A histogram is very similar to a bar graph, except that a histogram is specifically used for quantitative data. All right, quantitative data only. So you're going to organize, <clears throat> excuse me, your data in uh, classes, just like we talked about with the frequency tables. And then instead of uh, you know, making a table where you write in a frequency, you're actually going to draw a bar whose height uh, represents the frequency of that class. Okay. And I think that's basically what it says on this screen. You know, I don't like to read the slides to you. Sometimes I do, but I'm trying to get away from that. Okay. All right, so here is an example. This is the McDonald's uh, example that we did last time. And uh, I want to point out a couple of things about this. Let me just see, I set this up the other day. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, okay, so uh, if you recall from 2-1, when we did this example with the frequency table, uh, the class 75 to 124 had a frequency of 11. I kind of wish that I had put that table in here. <laughs> Um, the class 125 to 174 had a frequency of 24. So if you look on this vertical axis along the side here, uh, you can see that that bar is most of the way up from 20 to 25. Okay, so it's supposed to be 24. This one here from 175 to 224, I believe was 10. And then I think this was a three and that was a two. So one thing, uh, one other thing that I want to point out about this is you see these numbers that are written between the bars. Uh, we mentioned those last time under frequency tables, but we didn't really do anything with them. These are called class boundaries. So the reason that you see a 124.5 here is because this class stopped at 124, the first one, and the second one started at 125. They stopped at 124, started at 125, halfway between 124 and 125 is 124.5. That's called a class boundary. So the way that your book or the book that this course is based on, the way they uh, do their histogram is they put numbers between the bars only, and those bars are, or those numbers are the class boundaries. Okay. So notice uh, properties of a histogram. It does display the shape of the distribution. So this one peaks in the 125 to 174 class, uh, kind of tapers off after 225, okay? Shows the location of the center of the data. Uh, so I, the center of the data is probably here. What I mean by center is, um, sort of the halfway point through all the data. Okay, if you were gonna look at this list of 50 numbers in order, what number would be in the middle? The histogram uh, should give you an idea where that is. It's somewhere in this second class. Shows the spread of the data, how spread out is it? Okay. And it also identifies outliers. I don't think that this particular data set probably has any outliers. An outlier is an unusually high or unusually low score. If there was an outlier, it would probably maybe possibly be the very highest score, which I think was a 308. I have a feeling that's probably not an outlier. Usually an outlier in a histogram, there will be like one or two classes that have no data in them. 
and then all of a sudden you get over to the end and there's one there. So there's like a big gap and then, and then one or two pieces of data. Those tend to be outliers. Okay, so before we move on, I, I decided it would be a good idea to have that frequency table that I kept talking about but didn't have in front of me. This is the frequency table that was used to make this histogram. So again, the 124.5, that is the class boundary between the first class and the second class. First one ends at 124, second one starts at 125. So that 124.5 is halfway through. Okay, so a relative frequency histogram. We talked about relative frequency tables in 2-1, and we made one. It looked like this. So uh, you can probably guess what the difference is between a regular histogram and a relative frequency histogram. Instead of showing the frequencies like 11, 24, 10, it shows either the proportions, so those are written as decimals, or in this case, it did them as percents. And that's really good, especially when you want to compare data sets that have different sizes. Uh, in 2-1, toward the end, it showed how you could use uh, frequency tables to compare the uh, time to get through the drive-through at McDonald's versus Dunkin' Donuts. And I can't remember if those two data sets had the same size or not, but they were really easy to compare because we were comparing percents instead of raw numbers, okay? Uh, so yeah, it's really easy. If you wanna do a relative frequency histogram instead of a regular one, you just put percents or proportions along here instead of frequencies, okay? All right, moving right along. Okay, critical thinking interpreting histograms. Uh, so they, they suggest this, uh, they've got this little anagram here, CV dot. I guess they think that's gonna make these things easier to remember, maybe it will. Uh, so C stands for center, V is variation, so that's another word for spread, how spread out is the data. Uh, the shape of the distribution, whether there are any outliers, and time, okay? So histograms will tell you, uh, uh, give you some ideas about those things. Let me just see, okay. All right, let's pause that for just a second. For those of you watching the video at home, it takes a few seconds for my pause button to come up. And that's why you sometimes see me standing here looking awkward. All right, that brings us to some common distribution shapes. So you see here four different histograms. It looks like these are very large data sets. All right, so the first example in green, this one on the top left, this is an example of a normal distribution. I think we talked about normal distributions. I think that was in the last section. So uh, just a reminder, a normal distribution is one where it starts off small with small frequencies, peaks somewhere around the middle, and then drops back off small again toward the top, okay? And they are roughly symmetric. Notice this one is not perfectly symmetric. Uh, but it's, it's pretty close, okay? The idea with the normal distribution is as you make the data set larger and larger, it will get more bell-shaped and uh, symmetric, okay? But it's never absolutely perfect. The one in the top right here uh, is an example of what we call a uniform distribution. So that's where each class has roughly the same frequency. So a perfectly uniform distribution, the top of the histogram would just be completely flat, okay? Every class would have exactly the same frequency. Again, this is not perfect, uh, but they're all pretty close, okay? And then on the bottom, 
you see two examples of distributions that are skewed. Now they're skewed to the right and then they're skewed to the left. And I personally find it kind of counterintuitive which one is which. <laughs> right. So the, the bottom left one here in that sort of gray color <clears throat> is an example of skewed to the right. So when you're trying to decide which one is right and which one is left, imagine starting with one that looks like this and then stretching it at the bottom. So whichever direction you stretch it, that's the direction of the skew, all right? So like this one here, the one on the bottom left, um, you know, imagine it starts off, I think you can see the mouse pointer if you're watching the video, that's something I should probably check. Um, if I cut it off right here, about halfway between 30 and 40, uh, it, that would be pretty normal, okay? But then somebody took it and stretched it out going this way, that makes it skewed to the right, okay? So the direction it's being stretched is the direction of the skew, okay? This would be your exam that a whole, you know, a whole bunch of people did badly on except for, you know, the one person that you like to say, ah, you ruined the curve, all right? Just a very few people did well um, you know, everybody else kind of bombed it. That, that gives you a distribution that's skewed to the right. And then the opposite on the bottom right is skewed to the left. That's when I give a really easy exam and everybody aces it except for one or two people that have maybe never come to the class before until that day. Right. Um, interestingly, uh, a first exam in statistics is often skewed to the left. Usually people do pretty well on the first exam because it's, you know, a lot of relatively easy stuff. <clears throat> but I have given exams, unfortunately, where the distribution looks more like this. I'm not saying necessarily in statistics, right? um, but I, I have seen a few like that. All right, uh, this is just more of, of what you already heard. Uh, so we'll go through these next ones kind of quick and then I'll pause for the people in the room. So here's another example of a roughly bell-shaped uh, distribution. So this is what we would call normal. So you see that curve that's drawn over the histogram, that's this bell shape that they talk about. And when we get to a certain point around halfway through the semester, from that point on, we're going to be talking about almost nothing except normal distributions. All right. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, skewness. Skewed means not symmetric, extends more to one side than the other. All right, another term for skewed to the right is positively skewed. So again, uh, the direction that it's been stretched, the direction of the tail, they call it. Okay, so if it has a longer right tail, that means it's skewed to the right. And if it has a longer left tail, that means it's skewed to the left. 